Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we're trying to do these uh, semi-regularly based on kind of the applications that we think might be uh, interesting uh, to you. So I'm just going to get right into it. So first off, uh, just a general disclaimer. So uh, Biotage is a publicly traded company. And so uh, before you make any investments, just understand, uh, just understand there are risks involved. Okay, so today we'll be talking about buffer exchange and desalting and um, the, the goals that, that we have laid out uh, based on what we hear in the market is that for buffer exchange and desalting, it's very important to have high protein recovery. We want to have a very little residual salt. And so there's always a recovery or complete salt removal, uh, but what uh, you, you can never really have both because it's a chromatographic process and, and we can talk about that. Uh, we also set out a goal to do 96 purifications at a time using automation. And we want to maintain protein activity. So uh, in this case, we're using a gel filtration uh, chromatography to, to do the process. Um, unlike other desalting processes that might destroy the protein for mass spec, for example, um, C18 reverse phase, uh, that will denature your protein. In this case, we're maintaining protein activity for your downstream assay. And we'd like the ability to process small sample volumes. Uh, that's very important for us because as the uh, throughput uh, at, at, um, in your work increases, uh, samples tend to be smaller and uh, we have to work with smaller volumes. So what are the types of applications uh, that, that we encounter in the field in terms of uh, buffer exchange and, and desalting applications? So uh, typically we will do a post-labeling reaction cleanup. So uh, dye uh, removal and um, biotin removal. Uh, we also have applications for buffer exchange uh, for assay compatibility. These are assays that include um, labeling reactions. Uh, sometimes we need to exchange the buffer so that we can have an efficient labeling reaction. And also for assays, uh, analytical assays like isoelectric focusing or a capillary electrophoresis, uh, IEF, CEIF. Um, and then third, we've encountered uh, people that need to remove uh, components that will interfere with their downstream assay, especially cell-based assays. So we, um, one common application is to remove imidazole from a histide protein application. And so, uh, so it can be um, compatible with grant downstream assay. So I just like to start off. I, I think a lot of people on the call here are familiar with our current columns, uh, but most of our columns are, are using dual flow chromatography. And so these are a picture of, of, of different bi-tip columns, uh, 200 microliter pipette tip size or one ml pipette tip column size. And what we have are thin frit screens, a thin frit here and a thin frit here. And in between that, we pack our resin. So we pack five microliters, 20 microliters, um, and the small column. And then the larger column, we can pack 10, 20, 40, 80, 160, and in some cases, up to 320 microliters of resin. Now, these resins are, are protein A resins, um, IMAC resins uh, with a mobilized metal, um, things like that, ion exchange resins. And what we do is we do uh, chromatography with the, this resin, uh, and we call it dual flow chromatography. So these are pipette specific uh, columns. Uh, these are the nozzles here, or the fittings here are specific for the automation or robot that you have. Uh, we have a 200 microliter and one ml size. And then we have a choice of different resins that we can pack. So this is uh, highlighting the top screen, the bottom screen and the resin. And we can just modify this insert piece to have different geometries. So we can create different resin bed sizes. Um, and we do that so that we can have um, kind of the flexibility to give you the, um, the yield that you need, but also to control the amount of dilution concentration at the end. And so here's a picture or a video of uh, what we're talking about. So if we just uh, zoom into the end of our column, uh, what we do is we pump the sample back and forth through. So the more we pump back and forth through, the more likely we will capture the target molecule. And that's just highlighted here. And so by pumping back and forth through, we get complete binding, which is to say equilibrium binding. We'll never get 100% binding because everything is in equilibrium. And what we have in the interstitial space is the uh, impurities. So the next step is then to do a wash. 
Uh, so we'll dip the columns into a wash buffer and pump that back and forth. And effectively what we do is we dilute out this interstitial space so that we can get a good washer. And finally, we uh, dip the columns down into a new plate that contains a Lucian buffer and we pump that back and forth through. So the LU will then compete for these binding sites and then the sample can uh, be pushed out. So if we have just five microliters of resin here, we can elute that in as little as uh, 10 microliters. So we can keep the sample very concentrated. And by pumping back and forth through, we can get uh, uh, complete binding, which was to say uh, equilibrium binding. So that is our, our uh, dual flow chromatography system. This is how we got started as, as a company uh, making these disposable single use columns for uh, purification. So we compare very well against other technologies such as spin columns, uh, magnetic beads. So the, the dual flow chromatography gives us complete binding. The a small volume elution based on a small amount of resin and low to zero dead volume screens gives us a very high concentration of sample at the end. And we can process uh, any size volume that we want simply by dipping the column into a sample, pumping that back and forth flow and do, doing a, a stepwise capture. So we can have multiple aliquots of your sample and the head will just dip down, process, dip into the next aliquot and process back and forth. We have a uh, basically compatibility with the different pipette tip sizes. So we can use uh, one ml pipette tip columns, uh, five uh, 200 microliter pipette tip columns. And in the future, we'll be looking at uh, 20 ml pipette tip columns. When we do this back and forth flow and we get equally equilibrium binding, we get uh, very predictable results. And so this is scalable. Uh, it's not intuitive how this can be scalable to a laboratory scale or octa type system, uh, but because of that equilibrium binding, uh, we can we can uh, very much ensure that if you scale up using the same buffer conditions, the same sample, uh, you will get a predictable amount of recovery. And finally, we just we just treat uh, these uh, pipette tip columns uh, on a robot. Um, and we, we treat the robot simply as a pump. So a 96 channel head pump can load these columns um, and, and process 96 samples in parallel. So we're, we're completely compatible with different types of automation. Uh, the ones that uh, we are currently standardized on uh, are shown in this picture. Uh, the MEA2 is, is our own system. Uh, that's 12 at a time system with a pipette uh, on a tower. The pipette is made by Rainin. And we have a, an OEM relationship with Rainin. Uh, we worked with them uh, back when, we, when Bill Rainin was still, still around, still with us. Um, and they gave us access to their firmware. And so we can process uh, samples using very slow flow rates if we need to. Uh, we have the ability to, to process everything here uh, in a very robust and easy to use manner. Uh, a lot of times people will have this and as their needs uh, increase, then they will purchase uh, one of these types of robots. Uh, but more likely, we'll walk into a lab and we'll see somebody with a uh, Janus, for example, and uh, we'll have scripts that the, the Janus can use. So these robots are typically a 96 channel head, a 200 microliter uh, pipette tip column size. But a few of these robots uh, have the ability to process 1 ml columns, uh, the, um, the Nimbus Star Vantage system, um, also Biomech, the i7 now. Um, and then uh, the TCAN and Zephyr, they have eight channel. 1 ml uh, columns as well as the, the Janus. So this is a highlight of, of what we do and this this is what uh, what our production people do which is which is uh, rather difficult to manage but we purchase pipette tips uh, specific for the robot uh, because we don't want to um, do anything to compromise this part which is the interface between the tip and the, and the robot. Um, what we do is we purchase the correct tip and we modify the distal end. So this is what we modify uh, to pack our resin. So these are just a representation of all of the different types of, of columns that we pack. Okay, so now on to uh, what we're, we're here to, to really talk about, which is the gel filtration chromatography. Um, and we use that for buffer exchange and desalting. So, uh, as I highlighted before, uh, these are kind of a sampling of what we have. And the observation, there were two observations that we made uh, when we developed this and we were testing it. First is if we added a drop of buffer to the top of this and put that right onto this top screen, we would recover that buffer down here at the bottom. 
and the, the volume that we add on top basically is the volume that we get back at the end. So that, that was very intriguing to us because we thought, well, maybe instead of just back and forth flow, these columns would be compatible with the traditional top-down chromatography process. Um, the other aspect, the other observation that was very interesting to us is that if we add a, a volume of buffer and we let that drip through by gravity, the meniscus of that buffer as it travels down will stop once it hits this top screen. And so that, that was a really big uh, breakthrough for us because we knew that then the resin bed would remain, hi uh, remain hydrated throughout the, the purification process. And we said to ourselves, if we can manufacture columns and guarantee that they will all flow at about the same rate relative to each other, then we can process 96 at a time. Some columns will flow a little bit faster, some will flow a little bit slower, uh, but what happens is that all the columns will remain hydrated because that top meniscus will stop. So these screens resist airflow from going in through the column. So if we did not have that top screen, uh, the, the resin bed would eventually dry, we would get some cracking, and then uh, we would get some uh, channeling. But because we have the screen here, we can keep it wet. And, and that was, was uh, how we, we uh, worked on uh, these gel filtration columns. So these are the two products that we have that are uh, on the market. We have two flavors. One contains uh, just 200 microliters of resin. And we use this to process sample volumes of about 20 microliters up to 90 microliters. And then this column, this is 600 microliters of resin. And we use this to process 100 to 400 microliters of sample. We pack two different resins. Uh, there's a 5K, 5,000 molecular weight cutoff resin and a 10K molecular weight cutoff resin. So these are very much intended to be used for buffer exchange and desalting and, um, and separations um, uh, based on, on very large differences in size. So these are true chromatographic columns. What I showed you, did, showed you in the video in our traditional products was dual flow chromatography, where we dip down and we pump sample back and forth through. That really allows us to have this equilibrium binding. In this case, with gel filtration, we can only pass top downs, um, and that's how we get the most performance. Uh, these columns are manufactured with minimal column to column variability. And so these um, actually go through an additional QC relative to our other products, and that QC is for flow. These are uh, packed bed columns, and they're packed between two thin frit screens. And these have validated procedures. We have uh, customers that have been using these uh, for, with, with very good uh, results. So we can do uh, high performance uh, purifications uh, with this column. Even though it's a single use disposable column, we, we get very good performance out of these. The results are, are very reproducible and very much amenable to automation because of how we are, are QCing them, how we're manufacturing them. We get this resistance to airflow at that top uh, uh, resin, um, excuse me, top uh, screen here. And that allows us to maintain a hydrated resin bed. So we can, uh, we can guarantee that the, the, the process will, will function, um, even though uh, there might be some columns that flow faster or slower than others. And it's very easy to set up and use. So this is uh, a, a set of cartoons um, to kind of highlight uh, people to uh, showcase what gel filtration chromatography is, um, if, if people aren't familiar. And so uh, highlighted here is a bead. And these beads have uh, through pores. And these pores uh, are controlled uh, by the manufacturer to have different types of uh, sizes. And so the, the, the concept is that small molecules depicted by this red plus sign will get caught up in these pores and large molecules will be excluded from the channels. And so as we flow sample through the, the resin, uh, small molecules get stuck inside and then large molecules will, will just go right, right past. And so here's a, a set of beads, and here's our, our fictional sample here, and we, it flows through by gravity. And as we flow through, you can see it starts to get caught up, the little molecules, the large, large ones just kind of slide around and pump that through. And then uh, there's, there's a, it kind of starts, you'll see that there will, you'll get some separation between large and small molecules. And that's what it looks like kind of conceptually uh, just a set of beads. 
And then this is what it would look like if we were to pack those beads in a column. So we would add everything to the top and then we flow through and then we begin to get the separation. The small molecules migrate slower, the large molecules come out faster. So these would be your proteins. These would be your salts if you're doing a buffer exchange, uh, excess dye. If you're going to do a dye labeling reaction, you need uh, excess dye. This is how you can get rid of that. Um, and, uh, Imidazole, for example, and the LU went after uh, nickel IMAC purification. And then you get the separation. And what we're, we're looking for is the ability to, to have resolution between the wanted protein and the unwanted salt. And that, that, that depicts our, our resolution there. So we can collect this and discard the column. Um, and then uh, and this will come out uh, at the end if we continue to pump fluid through. Uh, Lee, there's a question. Yes. Could you repeat what is the sample range volume for the salting? Sure. Uh, I, I will uh, highlight that at the end uh, in, a, in a table. Uh, but our columns, uh, we can process sample volumes from 20 microliters up to 400 microliters. Thanks, Sean. Um, so this experiment kind of highlights visually what we're talking about, and this is a real experiment. Um, what we did was a kind of a, a stop caption type footage. So this is our sample. What we did was we uh, mixed uh, two, two components. What we did was we took myoglobin, which is brown, and it's 17,000 uh, Daltons, and we mixed that with a yellow salt called the DNP glutamate, and that's 313 Daltons. When we mix it together, we get this brown color. So this is a phytip column, gel filtration column, packed with uh, the uh, 600 microliters of 5K um, de uh, desalting resin. And uh, what I did was I just uh, pumped through uh, or, or allowed gravity flow of some equilibration buffer. Then I took uh, 100 microliters of this sample and added it to the top. And I did this manually. Um, and that flows through here. And you can see that the sample enters the resin bed and I collect the flow through here. So this is uh, 100 microliters added to the top, 100 microliters collected at the bottom. Um, of, I'm sorry, 200 microliters of sample, 200 microliters collected. Um, you can see it enters the resin bed. Next, uh, we did a series of uh, what we call chaser additions or elution additions. Uh, and basically we did fractionation. So again, this is the same column. This is a picture after equilibration after sample addition, and then after addition of 100 microliters of buffer, the next 100 microliters of buffer, the next 100, and the next 100. And finally, in number seven, we added a large volume of elution. We added 400 microliters of elution buffer. And so if we just look at the color separation, you'll see that the yellow and the brown start to separate here. And then pretty soon we're re uh, retaining only the yellow salt. And finally, after the big wash, the yellow salt comes out. And if you look at the fractions that we collect, we get this uh, light brown color. This is the myoglobin. We get a dark brown, so uh, myoglobin that's more concentrated, and then a lightish brown here, so the, the myoglobin is starting to uh, become less concentrated. And then this uh, collection is actually a little bit yellow, mostly clear, so some salt starting to come out. And then finally, the yellow salt is, is collected here. So uh, this, this is something that we, we recommend uh, a customer to do uh, initially for the initial proof of principle experiment, especially to fine tune what uh, elution buffer that they would like to use. So if the goal is to get 100% recovery, we would say uh, in, from this experiment, you would add uh, your injection would be 200 microliters of sample, and uh, you would add one to 300 microliters of buffer, and that's it. That would be your, your uh, process. If your goal was to get a completely uh, uh, salt-free sample, then we might uh, modify that to say, add uh, your 200 microliters of sample, and then subsequently add just 200 microliters of buffer. So we'll collect these, essentially what would be these two fractions, and then this, uh, which may have some salt in it, would be discarded. And so we could fine tune things by doing fractionation. Uh, this is, uh, and, and I'll highlight how you can you can do fractionation if you want to with automation. Uh, typically, we do this manually to dial in uh, what the process would be. So uh, we routinely uh, get 95% protein recovery uh, and uh, and very good salt removal. Um, and uh, here we're separating uh, two molecules, 
uh, based on size, 16.7 uh, kilodalton myoglobin and then 313 dalton myoglobin. And uh, we, we collected elution fractions in this example. Okay, okay. so what, what I really wanted to highlight in this slide was to show that the performance of the column is very much based upon how the column flows and, and our manufacturing process to be able to get very good flow. Because if they all flow the same, uh, then we would get reproducibility from column to column and from lot to lot. So here are 12 columns. And what we did was we simply just added buffer to the columns, a sample and a couple buffers. And we measured, uh, we weighed uh, the tubes before and after collection, and we were able to measure uh, how many, um, sorry, this should be microliters, microliters of sample came through. And um, you can see that uh, the SD values and the CVs are, are very tight, so uh, seven, a CV of seven um, for sample addition, also for buffer uh, one, buffer two. So we get very tight uh, CVs here. And, and in the real world, what we're doing here is then we've been uh, extended the experiment to, to look at uh, IgG uh, recovery. So we're, we're taking IgGs that we purchased and then we mixed it with uh, a, a salt and then we did uh, this recovery. So we looked at six columns in this case and we're looking at the volume we recover as, as a final uh, experimental um, parameter. Um, you see, again see very tight CV for final volume recovery, the concentration, uh, mass recovery, and then the, the percent of the protein recovered. Uh, it's very, very good. In this case, 76%. Uh, mm. We probably can push this up more if we added more volume uh, in the uh, elution side. And uh, what we also know is that uh, a lot of our customers that are using our HIST uh, Nickel IMAC presence to, to perform histac protein purification uh, do not uh, need to do a desalting to get rid of that imidazole. So imidazole is used to elute histac protein from a nickel IMAC column, and so we wanted to see how how uh, our columns perform. In this case, we had to use a HPLC to be able to look at the uh, imidazole. Uh, imidazole does not have a UV absorbance. So uh, this is our sample uh, right off the uh, phi tip column of. Uh, after nickel uh, IMAC purification. And uh, based on this peak, but we know because we, we uh, injected a, a sample, a uh, pure sample, so we know this is our hist histag protein, histag ubiquitin uh, protein peak. And then post desalting, this is what uh, the peak looks like. And then this is our blank. This is just uh, to show what, what our HPLC column was doing. Uh, this happened to be a, a certain column uh, that we had some experience with. And so you can see we got we got this uh, his uh, imidazole removal, and we get we re retain that uh, his ubiquitin peak there. So uh, what I showed you is, is is how we were processing the samples, um, and and how we we came up with with the process. But I think what's really interesting to most people here is how we automate the process. And so uh, if we automate this, uh, we we can look at it in very simple terms. First, we condition the columns, load the sample. And then we use the robot arm to move the columns to a collection plate, load our elution, and then collect that by gravity. And we do that uh, based on this adapter. We call this a gel filtration adapter. It holds the columns and allows the gripper to grip onto the columns, and it can move that from plate to plate. So we can do fractionation or move it from the waste to collection. And the distance between the end of the column to the bottom of the collection well is about one millimeter. So that allows uh, very small drops to be collected. So if you add a 20 microliter drop, uh, 20 microliters will form a bubble here, a drop droplet here and then because it's close to the bottom of the plate it will touch and then it, it will pull that drop off so we can get very very fine control of the volumes that we recover so this is a movie this is how we set up our deck so this is done on a t-can system we had to film this with the door open so please uh, there's another disclaimer uh, don't pro don't run your your pro um, robots with with the safeties uh, uh, unlocked uh, but we had to do this otherwise we got a glare so uh, this is how uh, we run it on a TCAN Freedom Evo uh, 200. So we have these uh, phytip columns are here above a waste position. Uh, this is our buffer. This would be the equilibration buffer and elution buffer. So we load uh, pipette tips 
aspirate buffer into the tips and then we'll load that to the top of the column and that will flow uh, by gravity so if these are 600 microliter phi tip columns, we typically um, do a buffer exchange will equilibrate in 700 microliters. We might do that uh, twice. Um, the other option is for uh, the user to, to just soak their columns overnight in, in, the, um, in the buffer of choice. Um, that's another way to kind of save some time here. So this whole process, we, we sped it up. Uh, the movie is about three minutes. Um, but the whole process in reality takes about 15 minutes. So next we pick up different pipette tips, the clean tips, and we're going to go to a plate that contains the sample that's tucked back here. Um, and then we can process in this column, uh, like I said before, uh, 200 or 100 to 400 microliters of sample. And we'll just put that right on top of the column. In this purification process, we know that the, the uh, protein will not come out in this early uh, phase. And so we actually allow that sample to, uh, to flow into waste as well. So now we have another pause to let that flow through by gravity. And then we'll use the Roma, the uh, gripper uh, on the uh, tea can to, to move the columns. So the Roma is over here. And we'll grip just the black adapter part so that can lift up the 96 columns and move it to this plate here where our collection is. And this is probably the most difficult part to, to automate is, um, is the teaching part for, for these movements, uh, but we have experience and I'm sure uh, TCAN can assist with that. And as you can see, there's really no accessories on the robot. Essentially, we're just using liquid handling functionality um, and then the, 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 the gripper functionality. There's no pumps, there's no um, <clears throat> vacuum stations, any centrifugation, anything like that. So we go back into this well. This has our equilibration buffer, which is also our elution buffer. So we're, we is, we, the goal is to exchange the buffers into this buffer. So we'll add this some predetermined volume, and we let that flow through by gravity, and our pure protein will be here. So you can see the setup, two boxes of uh, pipette tips, five tip columns, waste station, collection plate, sample plate, and uh, our buffer. And if you wanted to do uh, fractionation, then you can just set up your, your deck to have um, multiple collection plates. So there's plenty of room. And then also, if you wanted to do this in line with, uh, let's say, a uh, and IMAC purification, you can see there's plenty of room to do IMAC purification, and uh, then you can do the, the phytop column purification right after. So you can have a, a very streamlined uh, workflow. So uh, these are just a little bit clearer pictures, um, how we set up the deck uh, with the columns, collection plate, waste plate, sample, and pollution buffer. So first we aspirate equilibration buffer and dispense that to the column, do a pause. Next we'll aspirate sample, add that to the column, and do a pause. Then we move the columns to a, a clean collection plate. We will then uh, add our elution buffer, uh, aspirate, dispense, pause, and, uh, and our purification is complete. So this is, uh, I wanted to show again, uh, the column size that we have, the 200 microliter column. Uh, these are the sample volumes that we would recommend. Uh, the 600 microliter column, 100 to 400 microliters, and the, uh, these are the recommended elution volumes based on our work done with the uh, IgGs. So if we have a sample volume that is 80 microliters, we would elute in 90 microliters. And so in some cases, we don't get any dilution really of your sample. If your sample injection is small, then we would need to uh, dilute that. Uh, and we would need 150 microliters to elute that if we added just 20 microliters of sample. And so this is a real real world example of a CE lift uh, assay that we installed for our customer. And so in the manual process, because we could do uh, smaller volumes, so uh, we were able to reduce the sample volume, reduce the runtime from six hours to one hour. Uh, the, the price is uh, approximately the same based on NAP5 column and the FITO column. Uh, but what we get is a uh, hands on hands off automation. We can process up to 96 at a time and have uh, full automation. This is on the MEA. Eventually, this was transferred over to a Beckman FX. So uh, lower sample volume, lower runtime, uh, smaller amounts of reagents, uh, less labor time, 
increased batch size and then increased increased efficiency. So uh, just I uh, wanted to end here, just show that uh, phi tip columns are used for a lot of different purifications, uh, the 5K, 10K desalting, reverse phase desalting, and a lot of affinity purifications. So we're just gonna go right through to the end. And uh, I'll pause here um, and, and open, uh, open up the floor for any questions. Great, take care. Bye everybody.